Everybody, what's up? Welcome back to another episode of Fish Out of Water. We are coming at you live-ish from Saskia's beautiful studio apartment that we have completely overtaken. Um, so thank you, Saskia, for having us. Um, today, we're going to be interviewing somebody that is incredibly special and close to our hearts, somebody who has been a part of the Holy Rag community for a while now, but is um, such an incredible example of what Holy Rad believes in as far as what its mission is to support, which is celebrating bomb ass creatives who are paving a way for themselves and for others um so uh with before we do that um um i just want to introduce the rest of our hosts um we have to our left here saskia de borograf she's a head producer at holy rad studio and is also in charge of all content and operations um and elena to my right here our gorgeous incredible head of research and development um and as you know um i'm daryl i'm the founder of holy rad studio and um today like i said we're gonna have an incredible guest his name is kamau also known as mao but i'm gonna let him introduce himself to you so kamau what's up what's up tell the people um so i am kamal wainaina uh and i am a kenyan multidisciplinary artist um at the time of this recording i was based in new york city uh when it comes out i may be based in nairobi we shall see um but i specialize in film photography and music and uh under the name mao i produce and record music i have been doing so for the last I want to say two to three years um, in New York, which has been an amazing experience, especially getting involved with Holy Rod, especially finding my manager. Oh, yeah, I should have. Actually, that's my <laughs> yeah. fault. I didn't actually fully introduce Saskia. Um, also, come out. <laughs> so that's the Easter egg in this is, yeah, Saskia is my manager. <laughs> um, not that that had anything to do with me being on this podcast. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, so that's me. Yeah. No. Um, so come out. I'm. I. I. There's so many things that um, we can talk about with you because, like you said, you're a multi hyphenated artist. But maybe you just want to start from there. Like, what is it? What's your experiencing been um, uh, being multi hyphenated? I mean, for a lot of us, that conversation is centered around sometimes it being actually a hindrance. But post COVID, maybe actually being something that is a really great skill to have. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, you want to touch on that a little bit? For sure. Um, I started out doing photography actually it's, it's hard to trace because i think that i used to have an idea about me being an artist kind of starting in new york which was sort of reductive of what i did in the past i think that in getting sort of more comfortable with the idea that like art is about just the doing and not the reception i i can trace music back to much earlier than new york um and actually i think it might have been the first thing i ever did being just like young and into like theater and like singing and just just being like loud and annoying around the house like asking my mom about it like I just I'll just always make noise and like try and put on a show um and I think that you know being multi-hyphenated was sort of I think it's something you kind of just believe in yourself and just do yourself um it's it's about taking it seriously and it should be about the process more than your image. I think that um, when artists have like the sort of moment they start to go into like a, I guess, more of a career energy as opposed to just like doing it in the school. Not to say that they happen at different times. Like I think mine happened around the same time. Um, but it's an, it's a, like an inner compass thing where you know that you like to do this and this and this, and you should definitely explore this and this and this. And but in the same time, recognize that because you're doing that, your journey is going to look different than other people who may devote themselves entirely to one thing. And, and it's never, and it shouldn't be like a, a point of comparison. I think I still struggle with that daily, to be honest, it's hard, like sometimes, 
um, because yeah, comparison is ingrained in us, especially as as artists, and it can be very difficult to. I think imposter syndrome kind of hits differently in that vein, where when you want to do different things, you know, people are accustomed to seeing you in one field. Maybe your field of study or your you know main source of income lies in one medium over another, and that can affect how you see yourself and how you're seen. Um, and I think that was a definite tough thing when I started music was seeing myself as like a musician that despite like, you know, maybe lacking elements of formal training or the fact that I was a film student at the time, like I was making music and I, I was devoting time to it. And it just happened that in some elements, quickly some elements I you know, struggled with, I still struggled with, but it's like, um, I don't think there's like a, there shouldn't be a, uh, like a, a, a bar almost that people kind of because then you know people can be very dismissive of, of your efforts and I think we often do that as artists to make ourselves feel better is that we create this like thing like oh you can't do this because you're you know, I think everyone can do what they want to do but then obviously that leaves your audience to interpret it as you wish I'm, I'm on so many tangents there wow I hope I answered that question. I love a tangent we live for a tangent <laughs> We are here to record a tangent. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think the benefits of being self-taught in music are? Um, I think definitely resourcefulness. Like, this is a tough one. Because I, I mean, okay, I don't want to, not, not in a way that like, sorry, I help. I'm having a moment where I don't want to gas myself. Because it's not Come about gassing yourself, it's about <laughs> saying. <laughs> you can gas yourself. Well, it's just, I think, I think it's easier to know what your sound is when you teach yourself how to make, to do something. Like, to make music specifically, like, when you learn from someone else, it comes with influences of them and what they do. And, you know, you can obviously find, once you have, if they give you tools, you can find your own path with it. But I think that just kind of starting by yourself really means that, it's it's all coming from the inward, which is, has which has pros and cons. I found it really difficult to 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 make my sound sound like something at the start, especially like. And I knew part of that was also just a lack of technique. Like, it would sound odd or a bit kind of corny or like a bit plastic. I think it was it was a mix of stuff. It was a my technique, a the fact that I was using like stock sounds and things that were like kind of like not very textured and that came with knowledge as well like I didn't know that I could look for different sounds and I could try and just play different instruments and um but I think that learning myself that by the time I got better at music I knew what I wanted to make and that I think is a really useful skill in any in any field yeah so this discovery process that you're talking about, I think, is a very universal thing that artists do for a living, which is their their job is to explore on some mm-hmm. level. But for for you, Kamau, because your music informs your film and your film informs your music and that informs all the other work that you're doing. I mean, um, I think it would be lovely to hear from you what you feel like the role is of your work. I mean, in all its forms, right? Like what would you like it to be used for, if anything? I think, and it's, it's a word being used a lot now, and I don't think it ever undercuts its importance, but like, like healing to some degree. Uh, I think that's where it best functions as far as subject matter goes, is like, I find a way to understand my feelings and, you know, my just, my emotional state a lot better through music and, and it helps me, yeah, join links in myself and just make a better, make a better layout of just where I am and how I feel. And I think from what people have told me, that's a good thing that it offers. And I think depending on the, depending on the medium, it definitely varies because I know that music is how I assess how I feel internally. I know visuals like photography and film is how I sort of interpret my environment in in a way that actually is more focused on the environment and maybe a commentary on that and how I fit in that versus how I feel just like in, by myself. So, but I'm I'm always careful because I know that with photography and film it it's different to some degree. Like it's it's it can carry more 
weights in both directions. Like it can be like really powerful for someone to see something and it can also be very harmful. And I was just thinking about this in terms of, you know, um, I suppose this current moment of social change and, and social action and, you know, heading towards like reformation or abolition. Um, I think that um, it's a mistake that a lot of artists make where we think like our role to play in revolution and changes is just commentary and critique when actually like I don't have a lot of to say about certain things when it comes to even when it comes to the black experience especially when it comes to black experience in America because I'm not from here um, and and you know even like other places I've, I've been racialized my whole life but like I don't that's not what home is for me and like you know my passport is still Kenya and, a place, and that's a place where like I am very privileged and I come from a space where I have mobility that other people don't. Um, so I think in, in being more self-aware, I've realized that like, there's, there's the, there's the, there's what your art can offer people when they consume it. And then there's what your art can offer in a more active way. And I like the idea of separating the two because when people try and approach it in a way where like I'm the artist, I have this perspective that I can use to help people. Like it can become very self-serving. And that's a danger right now is is artists and creative people in general like have an inclination or tendency to center themselves on issues that don't concern them. So I think my role is definitely more about healing and getting what you want from the work. But as far as like a more active role, I'm trying to implement ways in which the actual end result or like be it revenue or be it a platform or be it whatever, can then come back to, you know, people who are doing the groundwork and um, recognizing, yeah, the role of organizers as opposed to like the artist just being like, I'm going to do everything, I'm going to do the face of everything. Yeah. I think that's really powerful. And I think it's important for us to share our experiences and the genuine nuance and range of experience behind every sort of cookie cutter identity box that you like check off and you know when you're taking an SAT or filling out a census right um so Kamal maybe that could be something that we could explore and hear a little bit more on is is the nuance of your experience because I think that um the three of us here do understand on some level at least the third culture experience um, mm -hmm. and not necessarily being from this continent. And as Hassan Minahash said, I think actually just the other day, um, which I, I think is very poignant, is that we come to this country as immigrants and, and, and are hoping for um, all of the excellence of this country, but we also inherit all the bad. Um, not to go on a tangent, um, and it's important for us to participate in changing um, the things that are here, um, mm -hmm. because you can't just come to America and only accept the very cookie-cutter American dream. You also have to be very real with the injustice that's going on. So that being said, I also think that there's something really important about increasing the visibility of other experiences as well. And so um, for you, in, and I think actually we, we talked about this, I'm sorry, I'm from taking this, uh, taking long, but we mm -hmm. talked about this with Jerry. Mm -hmm. And it, it was the concept that actually the best thing you can do is speak from your experience because you are an expert in it. So speaking from your experience and your art in all its forms sort of being your voice and on theme with feeling like you should focus on what you can say, what do you actually want to bolster, right? I mean, from um, from all the places that you've lived and where you were actually from, like what would you like to bolster from your experience and also the experiences of the people from your community? I think I... I think it's changing a lot more now than it was when I was younger, like coming, like being, when I first started sort of integrating identity in my work a lot more, um, it was just kind of the first phase that everyone, I think everyone goes through. And, and also, I mean, depending on, you know, where you're from and your level of privilege, it can come at different times. It can come with different, you know, sometimes it's positive purely, sometimes it's negative purely, sometimes it's a mix of both. and. I think in my case, it was definitely a mix of both where like it had always been, um, I'd always like kind of 
been aware of like my being third culture and um, being Kenyan, but then like my growing up in majority, like um, a white also uh, European or yeah, European spaces. I think the, um, I think it was, I did definitely want to bolster like that visibility. And, but I also think when I go older, I realized like, that that's, that's also dangerous because when, depending on how you, I think that what art is really powerful when it speaks from the self and being an expert in the self and being self-aware means that you can actually do better work and harder work and work that, you know, takes you to places of yourself and your background that you don't like and that aren't necessarily rewarding um, as far as being empowered or feeling, you know, um, yeah, rec reclaiming anything. I think that a lot of where I want to head now is actually trying to interrogate that side of things. Um, as far as just bolstering the idea that like, it's not clean cut as far as where you situate yourself, like where you're situated societally, um, especially within like, especially being African, being Kenyan, I think that I would either, I would find myself going to extremes where like it was either I was in America and then I'd have experiences or, you know, um, just like with regards to like racism or police or, or anything that would make me feel like hyper aware of my blackness and then, and then I'd express that and and then when I'd come to Kenya or like share that work with like my family, it was seen as a sort of, um, you know, cool, but not not for you to say or like not your place to say. And, and you know, there's, there's fact in that because like ultimately like I'm, my home is Kenya. But I think that I, was, I wasn't fair to myself and I wasn't really fair to the issue in saying that it's either or. I think that, um, you know, in, the idea is to try and look for the in-betweens and the meeting points that aren't exactly clear. And I think that a lot of people I've talked to kind of walk that line where it's like, part of me is here, part of me is there. It's not, the aim isn't to find a resolute answer that's very clear as far as like, I exist as this person. I'm going to only speak about this person. I think it, about this issue. I think it's more about like looking and finding the, um, yeah, looking and finding the, the nuances, even though I know that word like can kind of come across as cliche when it, when it comes to art. And, but I think that it is true. And it's helped me realize that I do want to bolster things like care, honestly, care and compassion that, um, that does require different approaches depending on where you are. And especially to the self, like trying not to be so critical that I then end up going in circles and, re and you know, finding myself like, oh, but I shouldn't say anything, I shouldn't do anything, I shouldn't explore this, or I, I don't have a right to feel this and put it on a song and put it in a thing. Um, I think that's also really dangerous. So right now, I think the things that I want to bolster are um, definitely self-awareness, but with care. Um, so, you know, being honest with yourself and taking hard critique, but also being caring to yourself and realizing that Ultimately, you know you're stronger than anyone else, but you have blind spots because you're also not perfect. So when someone points out a blind spot, like you can do better, um, and within your art, you can you can kind of change your position on things. Um, an example would be like I remember making like my film Clean Water. I had this end part where um, it was Saskia shot, um, where there was um, this the actor Patrick was walking down the street in like a hoodie and sort of like to show this idea of like a black American or um, just a black person in America. Um, and then as like someone came, the image changed to like a Maasai warrior. Um, and I didn't mean to, I realized in that moment what I was trying to show was, you know, that there's, there's a duality in a lot of people both can exist in the same person and that's what I really wanted to that's what I felt in that moment where I did feel frustrated and patronized by the idea that I can't um you know that I should try and separate or fragment myself into like strictly being Kenyan or strictly you know being of this or whatever parts of my identity are assigned to different environments um but at the same time when I was asked that question by the curator for this um one of the curators for this uh, showcase that I was in called Black Radical Imagination, 
uh, she asked about the polarizing um, element of it. And, and it's very true, it's a very good point because my experience, those things did find a bit of you know, distance between them because I grew up here and then I came here or you know, how I was seen and felt here versus that. But for a lot of people it's different and for a lot of black people it's different. Um, and I don't think everyone has to be perfectly on point with everyone's experience every time. But I think in that moment, I got a good look at myself and my work from another person's perspective. And I realized that like, oh, I, I actually maybe in hindsight, I did look at it a bit too, you know, black and white. And I think that in future, when I address ideas of third culture identity, I want to be more specific maybe to like the instances in which it comes up. So I don't end up creating this image, although it can feel empowering and, you know, um, it can give others, you know, a sense of being seen or, you know, being understood. It can also make others feel a bit more confused or, or disregard others whose identities don't necessarily play out that way. Mm. Yeah. Do you see us right now? Yeah. <laughs> Just... Am I making sense? God, I hope so. <laughs> making so much sense. Yeah. I mean, I wanted to, um, not that I'm desperately trying to transition, but I think that this is very relevant now, is the fact that you are soon moving back to Kenya, having been in New York for five years now. Um, and for a while, like in, in January, you wanted to stay in New York. And we were both pushing very much for you to stay in New York and trying to find ways to keep you here. Um, and then suddenly COVID hit and we kind of took a moment of pause to ask what would actually make you happy now. And it was, you know, although it is, there are so many tragic elements to you leaving, um, it was also to go home and to um, experience, you know, your talent and your music in your home country. Um, and so I kind of, I did want to ask in this podcast, like while we have time, um, why are you looking forward to going back to Kenya mm. and, how are you reflecting kind of on what your experience in New York has been, which I know we've agreed has been very frustrating at times and this is a really, really cutthroat city. Um, but why did we feel that desperate need for you to stay here, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. And now why are we so sort of just feeling, I don't know, a sense of relief that you're actually <laughs> being able to go home, you yeah. know? Why, why did we have that sort of transition in feeling? Yeah, no, I definitely, I think, I'm really just thinking back to like January and like being on the floor again. <laughs> Lol. <laughs> We're all just like, is that the same year? Yeah. It's honestly, and I think it's so tough because right now, you know, as I prepare myself, like, um, I'm just realizing a lot more about what this time meant for me and and appreciating the fact that like, it's, it's a time, like it was like a, a really, beautiful part of my life it's not gonna go away but like you know we have to move and grow and change and you know um it's not I think I had this idea of New York just being because New York instilled me with like such a momentum like you kind of feel like uh this is it you know it just keeps going like this and it keeps going forever and you know like that's why things have to move quickly and then I have to be like this huge artist at 24 and like and it's it's so weird like I I think that whenever I was in Kenya, I appreciated the fact that I was kind of off job, but I was still working and making things. Like I didn't feel like a pressure in the same way, but I felt a care, especially as I became more involved in the music scene and like more people heard my music. Um, that was really cool. And I think New York definitely played a, I mean, it was like the catalyst. Honestly, like the people I met here um, and the people I, you know, worked with and the spaces I was in really did solidify a lot of like my approach and work ethic and and even just like being able to, being able to move with the knowledge that like I do this, but I'm I'm not trying to be like my aim is to do this work. I'm not trying to be seen as this thing. And it's still something that like I, I'm trying to work out. And I think it's hard because New York still has elements of that. You know, people want to flex first and Nairobi definitely has elements of that. 
And what was cool is honestly being seen as this like artist person in my, by my circles in New York and then coming to Kenya and like no one knew I did anything. Like it was really fun honestly, cause it was just like, I was just my sister's little brother or my dad's son or my son, like it wasn't. And that was kind of like a relief honestly, because it did take a pressure off that I felt in my last two years of college to just be this like person. And everyone kind of has this idea of what you do and who you are and you have to like back that at every moment. Or be your work, that mm-hmm. you are your work. Yeah. Yeah. Like your work product specifically, right? Yeah. Like you are, like, yeah, like you but are your job. Yeah, it's yeah. the same thing. And I think in other professions yeah. too, like you're a doctor, you're a lawyer. But and it's that's the like export of like what is actually yeah. being made yeah. rather than it, the, the, it being an outcome of the process, which should really be the focus. I think yeah. that was really well said. Um, and it actually does remind me of, again, the conversation we had with Andrew from the Artist Liter- Literacy Institute, which focuses on the role of the artist's process as actually being as important and as investigative as and as difficult as any sort of scientist would approach their work. Um, and so that concept of play and freedom seems to be something that mm-hmm. is you're heading towards, yeah. which must feel fantastic, actually. If, you know, even if it does come with a lot of goodbyes, temporary goodbyes. It's never yeah. goodbye. It's just the see you later. Yeah. Yeah. But I do, I do feel that sense of freedom, even as, as your manager, I feel like as soon as we sort of pivoted towards, okay, you're not going to stay in New York. We're, you're going to go back to Kenya. Immediately those pressures of like doing everything for the clout and making sure that you're always getting published if you're going to release something like that is something that was um sort of installed in me when I became your manager was if Kamau's going to release something it needs to be published on this platform somewhere before he releases it mm-hmm. and I think that there's a as soon as COVID hit we were like well fuck that like can we just like fucking release well, maybe, it maybe you good know but music, also you know? i think the beautiful thing is maybe it was an illusion the whole time and i think this is actually a I really good it pivot was an illusion because yeah. another thing <laughs> that come out is incredibly good at is actually making really hilarious memes online and i know that that seems like yeah, a really going dark viral. i don't yeah. know if that's a really weird transition for you come out and i hope <laughs> that it's okay that i'm pivoting here but i i i think that it's relevant because you single-handedly empowered yourself and subverted all the sort of platform bullshit and went, I'm just going to make something dope and exciting and healing and loving and share it and invite other people to participate. And actually, I will let you tell the story of how you changed your audience even with like the way you're advertising because that was a fascinating story. So maybe, Kamau, you can talk about first like your process of like low-key being Twitter and Reddit, Reddit and like, Reddit yeah, like, like those are fast. They're just like fascinating stories, truly. What I will say, which is cool, and I definitely to your point, is like it kind of, in good and bad ways, it shattered part of the illusion because on one hand, you have like a huge amount of interest on you for a small moment, but not a lot of that is actually you can't really mobilize a lot of that to help you as a you know as a creative as a musician. Yeah, yeah. If and if it's not directly related to the work, like I think that if one of my songs was to get that same amount of traction it'd be a whole different story but but i will say it was interesting because it it did change my perspective and and that other point which kind of ties into shifting our perspective from clout and staying in in the new york is like um it's not a single like moment it's never going to be like a single rarely going to be a single moment i think for artists and and especially when it is a single moment it can be very difficult to move on from that versus gradually building or having like many you know like smaller but kind of big moments that will lead to you you know getting a bigger audience but because we're trying so hard to get these platforms and the more i think about it like the up and coming artists who get on these platforms too like it's not like an article changes your life like i think mm-hmm. it does it does not it does not you know and, and like i remember having that comment with Saskia. but i mean yeah. it seems like you are now in a position where you really are creating content with all of the different tools that you have from being a photographer and knowing yeah. Photoshop and being an editor and making music mm-hmm. and scoring films and being a filmmaker. It's like you've got all of this multi-hyphenated yeah. work it's that incredible. you have been able to achieve in the comfort of your living room, right? Yeah. It's like, this is like the moment. It's like, <laughs> just like, you know, it's just like, sir, and, and and I think really it's not to, not to demean what you've done. You took that opportunity and 
uh, put yourself in the driver's seat and said, I'm going to be in control of the narrative. So I think that's really what is so mm. dope about watching you do it. It's like, you're not clout chasing. You're actually just taking it as a tool and owning it mm -hmm. and using it to do exactly what you believe it mm -hmm. should be used for. And that is the illusion that people have with social media, right? Is that it's going to use you, but that's actually a little bit of a choice. You, you just have to know, I mm -hmm. think maybe have that moment of no, I can use it. I can, I can mm -hmm. steer it. So, um, you know, from, you know, just the way that you promoted, promoted your last single to even just Mondays with Mal to yeah. just like the very first breakfast song you've ever made. Like, I just think that that journey is fucking cool. Yeah. I mean, I think also something that we've really learned throughout COVID and the lockdown was also that your community are really like your best promoters. Um, and that building that community in an authentic way, um, means that every time you release something it might even be more powerful than it being you know on the front page of complex or whatever yeah um because you know also something i think that people like forget about when you get or well, something we've experienced is when you get published somewhere it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to their grid which has you know tens of thousands of followers it means you're getting put somewhere on their website where <laughs> no one is really seeing it mm. um and so obviously, you know, it looks good for you to take that screenshot and put it on your grid and have the name there and everyone's really proud of you. Mm. But it doesn't actually increase the spread that yeah. much. It's like the you illusion know? of being yeah. illegitimate, but actually all it Charger. does is kind of subvert the thing. That it, it doesn't actually subvert the thing you're trying to subvert. Does that, I don't know, am I saying that correctly? Yeah, it's more of a calling card, honestly, at yeah. that point where it's like you use it to show people to show first visitors, I guess, or even like people watching you that like you're to be taken seriously. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think that's funny because like when I think about the, the higher, the more established an artist gets, the less you see them post about like journalism about them because A, a lot of people are going to write about them when it happens and B, like they have people who care. I think that, and that's what I'm noticing now, honestly, which is really beautiful is like uh, there are people there who are like, a lot more concerned with, um, yeah, the music itself, like, or like the art itself versus like who's talking about it. And no disrespect, I think it's a difficult thing, especially when you're in New York, when a lot of your people, you put a lot of your early Instagram following are people you meet or your friends, and it's a different context to see someone in, and it's a different context to really, it's a hard thing to interrogate, I think, as artists, but like how we see each other and how we support each other is very like, um, it's very, it can be good and bad sometimes. And I think that we can have a tendency to like, you know, really focus on the wins only. We've been trained to have like a value system and it's very much ingrained with everything wrong with, I think a lot of the system, like, I mean, the system in general, but especially when it comes to art, like, you know, a lot of these publications that we care about are being run by people who don't care about you especially like me, I guess, speaking to black artists specifically, but like a lot of other, you know, subgroups, like, um, and that's a hard thing about New York too, is I realized that when it came to like me doing stuff during COVID and picking up attention, it was Kenyans I barely knew who were like writing for me, who were like sharing this, retweeting this, reaching out to me, like, um, and just seeing it like move across different spaces, specifically African spaces, and like them be like really engaged, just gave me like a new excitement that I hadn't felt in music for a bit. And I think that um, that's kind of a difficulty with New York in general is like it is really hard to to get people's attention here. You can grow here really well and make amazing things and learn a lot, but like to actually grow out of here organically is really difficult because everyone is trying it's like a lot of noise and everyone's trying to get attention and everyone is trying to look almost outward i think everyone here isn't really looking for new york artists as much um and so i think it was interesting to see that and it kind of it did give me a lot of hope but also a realization that like my focus really i'm doing a disservice to myself if i put my focus into perception and it's still hard to switch off because when like zombie flower dropped i was super excited but then i was also kind of bothered that like nothing had really happened immediately and I remember talking to Saskia about it and just being like ah oh, like why am I feeling like defeated like I'm really proud of this thing I'm really proud of you know like myself and Saskia and Jenny and Marcus and everyone who went into making this like a really 
you know, I'll be like in my opinion. Um, but it was still weird to not get the like, I don't know, the the uh, the attention, I guess, immediately. And I think that was like that's something I'm trying to unlearn. I think the more we move towards like kind of a social ecosystem of like supporting artists for the sake of supporting them and. No, I mean, it's so well said, Kamau, and I think that everybody needs to unlearn those value systems, and it's so subconscious, and that's really what I think is meant to be understood when they say that the work is internal. Um, It's that, okay, we are complaining as independent artists about how there are gatekeepers preventing us from Mm -hmm. entering into whatever industry that we're trying to enter, because it's pervasive across all industries, right? However, we still agree to those value systems in that our disappointment of not actually being validated by the very things that we want to sort of flip off and say, fuck you guys for not, uh, you know, being aware or, you know, the half-assed sort of apology from all of the institutions that are now waking up being like, given the current circumstances, like the current, the weak, you're the weak, now you're real and you just want to, you know, get so upset. Clearly I am. Um, but no, I don't wanna I don't wanna change the focus. I think that's so beautifully said, and I think it definitely is poignant to remember that even in COVID, right, the stage has always been global. It has always been global. The elitist illusion that being famous in New York means you're famous globally is also very a much a value system that we've got to dismantle. So what I'm looking forward to is seeing this transition for you and back home and knowing that like it's not like you're losing your New York audience really it's just you're extending and tapping into who your community and your family is and tapping into that and like loving them back and engaging with them directly which technology is allowing us to do whether it's Twitch or Instagram or Zoom or whatever like that feels really exciting and empowering Mm -hmm. Um, and so, um, you know, before we sign off, come out, I'd love for us, for you to plug some things that you're working on, some things that you've worked on in the past and sort of, um, when this is published, like what people should be looking out for. Yo, uh, thank you. I would like to, well, first and foremost, uh, the date of recording is uh, also the day of release of, uh, my brother Swami Sounds. Uh, it is what it is. It's an incredible project that, um, you know, in collaboration with Kenyan artists, I think is just something very new and something very beautiful. And honestly, when I think about my, I think that it being, it coming out now when I'm leaving New York makes me super happy because it just, it really shows that there's not, there's not these, you know, two sides and like a huge gap in between There's connections that have just been made you know, by, by virtual meeting here, meeting the people that I have and, and then meeting each other. Um, and it's, you know, then the 70% of the revenue from Bangkok is going to Fashion Friday, which is like an amazing initiative and, a, and a, an incredible um, black owned business by Friday, shout out Friday always. Um, and I think that that kind of, even seeing that kind of energy where, you know, you're redirecting it into something community-based, amazing. Um, but aside from that, I have a single that's out now, a single that's coming out soon, um, and a book that has been out for a minute, but I'm hoping to find it in print soon. It's called Doing My Best. Uh, 100% of the proceeds goes to Shofko, which is uh, a community program that's tackling COVID uh, in Kenyan slums. And yeah, it's been good so far. We've raised like almost over three hundred dollars, or hoping to get like more people involved, um, and hopefully find it in print soon, which would be great. But yeah, that's that's all I've got going on so far. Yeah. So wherever you guys are listening, we will put the links in the bio or the description um, uh, below, above, wherever you're going to find it, and so that you can easily access Kamau um, and all of the work that he does, and also the music that he's creating, and um, some of the music and work that you've also participated in, Saskia, as well. So, um, well, you're going to hear a little bit of Kamau's music in our podcast intro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Huge shout out. I completely forgot. Like right. this is literally the man who <laughs> created the the only piece of music that's in here right yeah. now. So. Um, yeah, like every single thing that he's ever scored for us, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, um, so yeah, big shout out and thank you, Kamau, for that. Um, so 
you know, um, I know that um, it's that there's so much more that could be said. And so hopefully we'll have another conversation with you, whether it's through Zoom or whether it's because we're actually visiting you or you're visiting us. Um, but yeah, we there's there's so much to be celebrating right now, um, even if it does feel heavy. Um, so thank you so much, Kamal, for your time and just for your presence and for your smile and your energy and all the healing that you do and loving that you do and cooking that you do. <laughs> Um, so yeah, um, we will, um, be back with another episode next week. So stay tuned. Thank you so much for following us and goodbye. Ah! Love you guys. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.